We're going to be talking about this. You ready for the title? When it gets severe, persevere. When it gets severe, and anybody have some severe things going on in your life? Trials, affliction, tribulations, problems. Any problem people here? Well, there's lots of problem people here, but are there any people with problems? <laughs> um, when it gets severe, persevere. Because the temptation is... When it gets severe, we want to quit. Where's God, right? Well, today, we're going to really break down three essential things to know. When you're in affliction, you might be in a hostile relationship. Uh, the Thessalonians were in persecution severely. So let's just begin to read the passage, <clears throat> and then we'll break it down. Are you ready, church? Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, those are Paul the Apostle with his missionary team, second missionary journey. They end up in Greece and uh, they're, 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 speak, they're you know, visited Thessalonica. When they arrived, nobody heard of Jesus. But when this team showed up, everybody heard about Jesus. And the gospel was ringing out. One person with one mission developing a team can change the world. You do know that, right? All it takes is one person saying yes to Jesus, and everything changes. And you don't just say yes the first time. You keep saying yes, 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 daily. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Daily, minute by minute, opera. yes, I obey, I obey. Uh, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of Thessalonians in God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is in God, in the Trinity, like we belong in, in, in them. Uh, in, the, in God the Trinity. So the next verse here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know, before you can have peace with God, you need to receive the grace of God. You don't get peace and then grace. You only get peace because of God's grace, because it was, and it was expressed on the cross, because Jesus stood in your gap you're a sinner, and he's a perfect holy God, the judge, and, and something had to happen to bring us back into pres God's presence. Jesus went obediently to the cross because it was a Father's will. He went to the cross on our behalf. He took our sins. Our sins were nailed when Jesus was nailed to the cross, and our sins were paid for because Jesus Christ, who always was, came from heaven to earth, and he came here to, to, to be a ransom for all of us. And when Jesus died and said, it is, it is finished, God accepted that sacrifice so that all of our sins could be forgiven because Jesus paid the price and endured the punishment for us. Amen? Amen. That's where grace comes from. You, and, and, and we must respond. The gospel, Jesus requires a response he won't force his will upon you. He says, I want you to receive this forgiveness. And then we, we receive it. We believe in Christ. And then we belong to the family of God. So first comes grace, then comes peace. You're at peace with God. Good Jesus, Jesus provided peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, He's like going to get into brag mode on the church, just like I can get into brag mode. It's a holy brag. Is that okay? <laughs> we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, and the word brothers, it's, it, it means brothers and sisters, okay? Uh, as is right. He's like, we, we ought always, I have an obligation to thank God for you because, and then we're going to find out what the because is, because your faith is growing abundantly. In the midst of severe persecution, affliction, trial, their faith is growing. You see, we actually grow through those things. And the love of every one of you, that's an awesome thing to say about a church. The love of every one of you for one another is what? Increasing. You're not okay with just, you know, I've loved a little bit and I, you know... Um, that's enough. That's easy now. That's enough love for you. It's all you deserve is just a little bit of love. He's like, no, your love keeps increasing. He's amazed because he had already written to them once, and he's finding out more and more. They're just increasing in faith, increasing in love. All right? Now, therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God 
for your steadfastness and your faith in all, all the persecutions and in the afflictions. You know, sometimes when I'm with other pastors and pastors groups, um, I brag about the new home. I brag about you. And it's like a little like weird to do, but I can't help it. Because I'm like Paul. I'm like, I love the church that God has appointed me to be an under-shepherd. He's the ultimate shepherd of you. You're his flock, but I get to be an under-shepherd with him, you know, serving him. You, this church right here, balcony people, all of you online, you guys are absolutely doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. And by the way, if you're new to the family, we absolutely cannot wait to get to know you um, and welcome. By the way, let, let everyone that's new, let, let them know where we're So we boast about you in the churches of God for your what? Steadfastness and faith. This is, this is wild. In all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Steadfastness, I, bragging on them. They were not letting the, the devil and the, and the assignment of hell and those people that were enemies of the gospel, they were not letting them put the fire out. Nothing. They let, they let the Holy Spirit kindle a passion and kindle a calling inside of their heart. And the word of God was like Jeremiah in them. It was like a fire inside of them. And they could not do anything but ring out the gospel all over Greece, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Evidence. This is evidence that the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Jesus said, if anyone, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. All of, our, all of our fleshly lusts, deny your flesh, deny yourself. Pick up the cross, inconvenience ourselves, even through suffering, and follow me. Jesus said that's what it looks like to be a Christ follower. Uh, indeed, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction, those who afflict you. Wow. God's going to repay. When? Let's find out. Verse 7. And to grant relief. Everyone say relief. relief. First say repay. Yes. Now say relief. relief. He's going to repay the afflictors. And he's going to relieve the afflicted. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed. So we've got number one, God will repay the afflictors. Number two, we've got God will relieve the afflicted. Number three, on that day, God will reveal the avenger. The avenger is coming. Racism will not continue. Hatred, murder, strife. Children's soul bought and sold into sex trafficking. My goodness, if there is a wickedness, that is one of the most wicked things ever. That's an abomination to the Lord. And they will, unless they confess and repent, there will be rec- uh, repayment time. And you could go on and on and list the horrific things. Selling fentanyl. Making and selling fentanyl, one of the biggest killers of people in our nation. Open borders, just let it all in. There will be a reckon that people are going to be dealing with God on this. I've done enough of the burials to know how horrific this is. You could go on and on and on. The sins of mankind, the wickedness, the depravity, and we're all guilty at some capacity of breaking God's law, aren't we? And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. (laughs) I want you to let your, please, don't anyone tap out. Don't anyone, you know, disengage because I want your imagination 
to take in the word. Let the word form your imagination because this is very descriptive language, okay? Um, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, verse eight, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. How many of you believe that what Jesus says is true and will come to pass? Now this part makes me cry. This part makes me weep because God does not delight in the perishing of the wicked, neither should we. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Word of God right here. The punishment of eternal destruction. This is the worst part, comma, away from the presence of the Lord. Do you know that everything that is beautiful, everything that is good, everything that is wonderful, everything, a meal, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, the ocean, the mountains, the the green grass, the birds that fly and chirp in the sky and the whales that swim in the ocean and everything that is good and everything that God has blessed us with is common grace. It's common grace that sinner and saint both partake of God's common grace. But when, if somebody rejects the gospel, continues to be an enemy of God, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away. This is what hell is, away from the presence of the Lord because there's nothing left. You've got nothing good left. That's hell. Utter darkness, light is gone. Everything's gone. And from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Why do we get to marvel? I'll explain it later. Because the testimony of the gospel went out. And it was believed by you. Do you get to take credit? Oh, I earned my way into heaven. I climbed that ladder and I was a good religious dude. God's like, "Uh uh-uh, you'll never get there that way. As Caleb preached recently, it's God climbed down the ladder to come to us to humble himself and go to the cross because there's only one way that God provides. There's the narrow way, the one way, and he wants everyone to come in through his way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And God wants everyone to get to the Father. Whosoever will come. To this end, now Paul goes into a prayer session. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. Live live worthy of his calling. And may fulfill every resolve for what? and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come to you on bended heart because this is the word of God. It speaks to us. It's like a powerful revelation that moves something in our inner being which causes us to live differently. So God, I pray this message would be anointed, received, and Lord, we would be different. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Hey, real quick, I want to tell you something. Have you ever been through some afflictions or trials? I've already asked you that. I want to tell you what New Hope has been through since 2018. We started to look for property because, property because we didn't have our own house big enough to, to, to provide capacity for the growing, the, uh, for the growth of our church. And so, we, you know, we still to this day do not own one parking lot. Does anybody know that? Yet we're, we've grown to do just about 700 in-person attendance weekly and hundreds online. Um, but so God always provides, right? So we knew we have to get a building because at Memorial Hall, we were meeting there. People couldn't park their car. There was nowhere to go. They would circle around. All the parking spaces were taken. We're like, we can't allow this 
incapacity to stop us. So we bought, you know, we decided to buy land. Well, we looked and looked, and we finally found some land. And um, we then the whole, the whole like uh, year, years long process began. And uh, it took us, that was five years ago when we started. We had difficulties with negotiations on the price of the land. We, we then had to raise money that we didn't have. We ended up with lots of difficulties with design. And we went back and forth with that. With abutters, we had opposition, opposition, signs on Long Pond, people opposing something good. And uh, we had long, drawn-out meetings. How, how many were there at the planning board meetings? How about three hours every time? Several of those. And then we went into long, drawn-out meetings with the zoning board of appeal meetings. How many were with us at those? Three hours at a time. We just had constant setbacks. We had constant opposition constant but you knew hope chapel you do not give up i mean you were like there hanging through everything thick and thin and then once we purchased the land we you know we had to get approval we did get approval how many remember that night that was awesome um we we hundreds of details talking to banks talking to bond companies setback after setback and some and some Cases along the way, we were dealing with straight up evil people with evil assignments, throwing obstacles in our way, setback after setback in some cases. um, And then by uh, month by month, week by week. But listen, prayer by prayer, that team, we have a team that does not stop meeting, nor will they until we open the doors and we'll probably still gather for prayer on that day. Every single Friday, we all persevere together. New Hope Chapel. Um, and now, here's what I can say now. I want to give you a quick report. Now, most, all, most of the excavation work is done. The perimeter found, not only the footings, the footings were done weeks ago, but now the foundation is done on the perimeter. You have some inside stuff to do. And um, this thing is moving forward. And here's what I want to tell you. This is the best news of all. You remember about a month ago I stood here? And said, we are $480,000 short to close. Now, we can pull money from that fund in this fund and get halfway there. But we didn't want to pull money from those funds. And so that, you remember that? How many of you prayed over that? We've been praying for that. I'm telling you, God is a God who answers prayer. So we went and, and so we just kept praying, believing God, celebrating. Thought, checks for 10000 were coming in. Wow. You guys are so sacrificial. Checks for 5000 Hey, listen, if it, it's not about the size of the gift. It's the sacrifice of the gift. Some of you, if you're given $10 as a sacrifice, we're not bragging just on amount. But we're saying we have people that are believing God for this thing. And so we had, you know, different ones kept coming in. We, we got a check from a couple in this congregation, $140,000. Right? Now, and then more checks kept coming in. And so we were about $200,000 short at this point. And, and wouldn't you know it, I think it was last Thursday, we got a check for $300,000. So now we're not only ready to close, but we have 100000 or so surplus without taking from those funds. Come on, we need to just say praise God for what he's doing. So exciting. So exciting. So exciting. But God, but God, but God, but God. Now, um, (laughs) we still have a big mountain. Jesus said, if anybody has a faith of a mustard seed, he'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the deepest sea. And here's our mountain that we're going to be dealing with over the next however long. We have a mountain-sized debt of $6 million. But how many of you know God brought us this far? He's going to finish the rest. What are mountains to God? Hey, mountains are nothing to God. All he needs is people with a little mustard seed-sized faith that actually exercise their faith. You guys are amazing. God is good. He is faithful. I just want to ask you about your life. You see, I just described all the things that we went through together as a church. But what about, what about you? What's happening in you? You got stuff going on in your life? Maybe some obstacles. Maybe just like, maybe there's an addiction, something that you say, I just can't seem to tackle this. And it's, it's really bringing you low. 
Some of you are struggling with depression. Some of you are struggling in some kind of trial. It could be family. It could be your health. It could be financial. It could be relational, marital. It could be like in your single life feeling an overwhelming sense of loneliness. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. Don't give up. When it gets severe, what are you going to do? Tell the neighbor next to you. When it gets severe, persevere. When it gets severe, persevere. Don't quit. Don't quit. I remember uh, preaching in Memorial Hall one day, preaching a message, and in the middle, the Holy Spirit stopped me, and he said, somebody's uh, contemplating suicide. I stopped my message, and I said, there's someone here contemplating suicide. God is the author of life. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he has come to give you life abundantly. God is going to give you life. You're going to get through this and you're going to live. That person went home already with a decision that he was, they were going to, she was going to kill herself, instead decided to live and now is living full on for Jesus all these years later. So I'm telling you what, nothing is too big for your God. Can I have the, can I have my sermon prop, please? Um, First Thessalonians, what's going on with them? I mean, Second Thessalonians, I did it again. I've, I've been writing for one in front of it. So anyways, since Paul's earlier letter, First Thessalonians, now he has to write another letter because he found out that the persecution that was against them is getting more intensified. It's getting worse. And Paul wants to write a letter to commend them on how well they're doing, but also to inspire them to keep going. So the Thessalonica church is a really good model for us, but it was important for Paul to come along and write to them, just like I'm here. I'm like, a, in, in some ways, I'm like a coach. You, you guys are the ones that need to get into the field. What good is it if I'm the only one in the field and you're just spectators? It's like going to a football game. You're in the stands cheering, but it's reversed this way. You're not an audience. You are, an, you are an army. We are not an audience. We are an army of God. So as a coach, <laughs> preacher, I'm saying, you're going to win. You're going to make it with God before you. Who can be against you? But because you're experiencing fiery trials, do not be surprised at them. God is with you. In fact, it's those trials by fire that develops the gold inside of you so that you can produce good things for Jesus. Amen? Amen. So the trials are good news that God is working in you. Oh my goodness. So Paul wrote this to praise their endurance, but also to encourage them with solid theology of the coming of Jesus. This means everything simply because um, they were Christians in a polytheistic culture. They, they, it, it wasn't they didn't go on the marketplace and into their job saying, hey, that's awesome that you're a Christian. That's really good. Let me give you a raise. It was the other way around. Hey, how about I fire you because of your religious convictions? How about if you don't do what this government says, you actually get canceled out? And that's happened, right? Because of religious convictions in the military, in the medical industry, all over in corporations. If you held to your, your convictions, you were gone didn't matter how much you produced. We, we have levels of this hostility now. But listen, nothing compared to what they were going through. And here, I want, I want to give you, anybody want to hear what's going on around the world with persecution? Anybody care? Oh, good. Uh, this is according to World Watch. Here's a list. Around the world, there are more than 360 million Christians who are suffering discrimination, uh, who are suffering persecution and discrimination. more than five years ago. It's ramping up. The next thing is 5,621 Christians were killed for their faith just last year. How about this one? 2,110 churches were attacked. Just Myanmar, Myanmar, I think they call it. There's like, they had like 70 churches bombed or something. Uh, Go back to the other one. Uh, 4,542 Christians were detained. One in seven around the world are persecuted. One in seven, one in five people are persecuted in Africa alone. Two in five are persecuted in Asia. This is crazy. Look at this one place called Myanmar. I heard, I heard a, a man speak from there when I was at a missions conference. 
70 churches have been firebombed. This isn't a big, it's the Burma, you know, Burma. It's now Myanmar, Myanmar. How do I, does anybody know how to say it right? Yeah. Colonel, you know? Yeah. Myanmar, okay. Um, pastors are being killed. Christian, <laughs> Christian villages are earmarked for bombing their crime. They're Christians. Going around the world. This is what our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing. The Reverend uh, Colum Sampson from Myanmar, he was accused merely of holding a prayer meeting with members of the opposition National Unity Government. For this act of incitement, the former head of the Cachin Baptist Convention, who had actually prayed at the White House for President Trump, was sentenced to six years in prison in 2023. Why? Because he held a prayer meeting. Our brothers and sisters around the planet are undergoing some severe, severe stuff. So whenever you think that what you're going through is severe, I want you to remember the faithful in these nations. And guess what? Do you know what happens? The blood of the martyrs became, becomes the rocket fuel of evangelism. You do know that, right? It's like the seed of evangelism. So it doesn't slow it down. What the devil meant for evil, he actually turns around, on, God turns it around on its head, and he he, he moves evangelism forward faster. Just at the Passion 2024 conference, all Gen Z, all Gen Zers, don't give up on this generation. They are the, according to uh, Barna, they are the, they are the, the, how would I say this? How do I interpret this correctly? They are, there has not been a generation like them in many decades because they are more open to God than previous generations. Do you know what they did when they gathered 55,000 of them at that conference, what, a week ago? They raised $2 million. Gen Zers collectively raised $2 million to get the Bible um, interpreted into different people group languages to reach the nations. <laughs> Folks, James, we, and Caleb, we have an opportunity now like we haven't seen in a long time to raise a, how many how many gen zers are in the house stand up if you're here come on stand up gen zers because we believe in you we have hope in you we believe god's going to use you and inspire you and raise you up and send you out wow keep following jesus that's not even mentioning the millennials in the in the in the room how, so how can we persevere? Because you're going to need to, Gen Zers. You're going to need to persevere. How can we persevere through affliction? By knowing these three things. By knowing these three things. Number one, God will repay the afflictors. You need to know this because you cannot give up. You need to know that, even, that right now you're saying, when, oh God, when is justice going to prevail? When? When? Um, verse 6 says, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who are afflicting you. He's saying to the church of Thessalonica, guys, look, it. I don't want you to think that this goes ignored by God. Your suffering, your affliction, your persecution does not go ignored. Your God is, it's all built, he's gathering it all up. God will repay the afflictors. Verse 7, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. In other words, anyone that wants to not live godly in Christ Jesus, those who reject the goodness, the holiness, the love of God will not be in eternity at all. And because it's not because God doesn't want them, because he went through a lot to call them. His son crucified? Who would crucify their son? For the, sin, the, the sinful world. Jesus, God would, the father, the father that loves this world. God so loves the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish. But there are people, now look, C.S. Lewis said this. You can either say, Your will be done. Your kingdom come, your, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Or God, if you, but if you won't pray that and you, re, you want your will to be done and not God's will, God will give you that. If it's your will to reject the God who provided salvation 
his love, then God says, okay, your will be done. I'll honor your free will. Your will be done. So no one could ever blame God. They can only blame themselves for the repayment. Now, if we would go, please go in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. I want you to see what it says in the Old Testament. God saying this himself. Vengeance is mine and recompense. For the time, for the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand. There is a day when wicked people, their foot's going to slip and calamity will be at hand. And their doom comes swiftly. Now let's, let's look quickly, if we could, at Romans 12, 19. So that's the Old Testament. What does the Bible say to us? Because we are tempted to become the judges ourselves, are we not? Beloved, Paul writing to the church at Rome, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So before you want to be quick to be Liam Neeson, right? Although if my daughter was taken, I'm going Liam Neeson. And I'm going to preach the gospel to the dude first. Um, But you know what I mean. But, you know, so many people are, are acting as though they're the judge. They're judging everyone. Leave that to God. Leave that to God. And then I want you to see, like, see if you can identify with with the psalmist named Asaph, okay? So look at um, verse one, uh, one through three. We'll look at that first. Truly God, this is, the, this is Asaph. He's in this place, you know, where he's seeing the wicked prospering and it seems like they're healthy and all these things and it seems nothing's going wrong with them, yet he's trying to live righteous and he doesn't have those things that he sees the wealthy or, the, or those wicked unbelievers. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, verse 2. But as for me, my foot had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Anybody been there? Oh, you're too. I've been there. Come on. One thing about New Hope Chapel is we're like real. Like, I hope. And then, and then jump to verse 5. They are not in, it, it says, it feel, he feel, feels like this. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Keep going. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. You know, that's one of the things that MLK came, Jr. came against. The oppression against black people in America, how wicked and evil the human heart can be. Just arrogantly thinking you can own a person. It's just one example of many examples of wickedness. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts through the earth. And then jump to 11, verse 11. And they say, how, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean. Anybody been there? Like, what am I doing? I'm trying to live right. All in vain. I kept my heart clear, clean, and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning, he says. Verse 16. But when I thought, And I thought how to understand this. It seemed to me a wearisome task. Until, everybody say until. (laughs) Heads up, look at me. Everyone say until. Until. Don't you love the untils of your life? When you get the revelation, when it dawns on you, when the penny drops, you go until. I was here in my life. Here's my testimony. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was shooting dope. I was lost, I was beating people up, but then I found Jesus and now I'm, I'm serving people, I'm loving people, I'm feeding people, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm not who I used to be and I'm still not who I'm yet to become, but Jesus is with me all the way until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. And you go, 
Wake up. Verse 19. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. Verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you, Lord. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me into glory. You see, I brought a telescope up here, and thank you for the telescope. You can look through either one of these lenses. If you think about this as a metaphor for what we're looking at in this life, if you want to focus on the here and now and all of the minute problems, you look, you're looking in the wrong side of the telescope. You're focused in on the bill that you owe, the way your child might be acting now. All of the things right now you're focused on, but the Bible says, set your eye, your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. So what you need to do is change your view of what God has in store for you and look through the right side because what you'll see is future expanse You'll see what we call eschatology means the study of last days where God is going to, Jesus Christ is going to take his church up. There will be tribulation on the world and then we will come down with him at the second coming of the Lord and he will rule and reign and he will repay those who have done wickedly. You know, God has a track record. We got a few minutes to go here, but the music is beautiful. Um, The music is beautiful. God has a track record. His track record is he has already shown us that he repays others. Remember when Pharaoh tried to to drown all of the male babies in Egypt, thinking he's going to obliterate the Jewish people from from the world? Uh Uh-uh. He didn't accomplish all that he wanted to do. But what God did is when God released Israel from the bondage of Egypt, he opened the Red Sea. They crossed on dry ground. And when the army of Egypt tried to follow them and destroy them or take them to back, God allowed the waters to come back on them. And guess who got drowned this time? Pharaoh's army. And then when... Haman, in the book of Esther, he plotted to wipe out the Jews. He had some gallows built to to have them hung. Instead, he and his sons were wiped out, and they were the ones hung on the gallows that he built. How about Daniel, King Darius, right? uh, His advisors forced him to arrest Daniel and throw him into the lion's den. But God, God rescued him, And the advice, you know, when he was in the den, the lions weren't hungry. But what happened is when, when God preserved Daniel, it was the king's advisors that ended up in the den. And at that time, the lions were hungry. God has a track record. And I want to say this to you, the evil assignments that evil assignments will not prevail against you, but God will prevail against the assignments that are assigned to you. So the evil assignments that have been going after you will not prevail, but God is going to prevail. And what he's going to do is he's going to prevail against the evil assignments that are going after you. God wins every time. Second point, God will relieve the afflicted. So God repays the afflictors, but God will relieve the afflicted. Verse 7 says, and to grant relief to to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Do you know what relief means in Greek if you take the nuances and put it all together? I'm going to give you like the definition. It's like the grip of affliction has now been finally loosened and you are liberated from the enemy's affliction. And now you will be given rest and be utterly and eternally at ease from the oppressing oppression of, of the enemy. Imagine the relief when Christ is revealed. Imagine no more oppression. Afflictions are gone. Suffering's gone. The enemies are vanquished. 
Jesus is reigning because he cloaked himself with the robes of justice and he dealt with it all. Which side of the telescope are you looking at? I'm going to give you rattle off a bunch of scriptures. Get ready. Get ready to, to consume these, okay? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us, what? An eternal weight of glory beyond, everyone say beyond, beyond. comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I want you to know, it's very important for you to persevere when life gets severe, to look in the right lens. This is the wrong lens. This is the right lens. Miles, can you join Rob? I need that stone. Somebody, Miles, just come back here. Caleb and Rob, if you could, guys. There's a stone on that chair that I want you to see. This blew my mind. When I read this scripture this morning, this is a passage that God put on my heart. There's been, Elliot uh, and, and his wife, Victoria, wanted to give us a gift. I didn't know what it was. He just kept saying, hey, a few days, I, we just have a gift for you. I want to meet you. I want to give you a gift, right? And I want you to see what the gift was. He had no idea what I was preaching on. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You know where that's going to go? That's going to go in the slab of our brand new church. So you will walk by that and remember, that's exactly what God wants us to do. How do you persevere? How are you going to make it through? Why aren't you going to quit? Because you're going to fix your eyes on the things that are unseen, not on things that are seen. It's easy. Jesus said, uh, or the Bible says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Thank you, guys. Unless you want to hold it here for eternity, it weighs about 100 pounds. Let's look at another scripture, 1 Peter 6, 1 through 9. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 1, 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. This lens that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And then 1 Peter 1, 13, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. I just read it from a different version. Set your minds for actions, guys. This is no time to not be sober-minded. He says, we keep hearing this, don't we? Be sober-minded. Set your minds for action. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Third point, final. God will reveal the avenger. Verse 6, since indeed God consider, considers it just to repay with affliction. The, uh, verse 7, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance, on those who do not, not, not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the glory of God. And when I read this, I, this morning I was reading it, and uh, yesterday was my dad's 12th anniversary of going to heaven. And when you read a passage like this, we don't get excited. Our hearts grieve over those who keep rejecting Jesus. 
One of the things my dad did that I treasure is he raised us up in the scriptures. He talked to us about the Lord all the time. But the last maybe 10 to 15 years, from time to time, he would invite his sons. We all had kids. We all had busy lives. On, every now and again on a Saturday, he'd cook us a really great breakfast. And then he wanted to pray with us. And he would talk about all the family members, our kids, our wives. And then he would list all of the cousins and the distant relatives. I have, I have relatives that are atheists. My father grieved over their hearts. Just like the Lord, he doesn't take delight in the perishing of the wicked. So my father would have, we would all be praying for this cousin and that cousin and that uncle and that aunt. By name, this took a long time, but my dad, big carpenter, strong, big, wide shoulders, massive hands, carpenter hands, he would begin to weep over their souls because he knew the options and he didn't want any of his relatives to be anywhere but heaven. You know that your prayers will plunder hell and populate heaven. Beginning on your knees for those that you love and know that are so lost. On your knees you're doing spiritual battle and warfare for the very souls of people. And that's, that's what starts the movement and the, and the momentum of God to move in their hearts. And we saw one relative after another over decades because my father's prayers come to Jesus. I know it's 1201. I, I just, I'm sorry, kingdom kids. Hold on. We're almost there. It's two things that are going to happen. There's two groups of people. There's those that are going to be seeing the day of the Lord as, glor uh, as, um, as judgment day. It'll be revealed to God's enemies, what I just described. That's judgment day. And then there'll be glorification day. And that'll be revealed to every believer. Watch this. Here. Those of you, you're struggling. Life is hard. I just talked to someone this week that's getting abused on a regular basis. Believe me, I'm working to help that beautiful person get out of that situation. Verse 10. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. When he comes on that day, what's going to happen? Do you know that Jesus is going to be glorified in you? you do, do you know that? And, and he's going to be marveled at among you. And here's the thing. What, what the word marvel means is to be stunned by. To be absolutely and utterly amazed at. To look at with such wonder. When, they, when you see Jesus in all of his glory at his second coming, all of us who are saints are going to be going, whoa, can you, this is better than we thought. Give me a high five. We're going to be with him forever and ever marveling. How do you know that you'll be the one marveling at him as a glorified saint? Here's how. You start marveling at him now. You say, I want to know. Maybe you're like here, you're like, I don't know him. I want to get to know him. The scriptures are full. Our church is all about presenting Jesus to this world. Life groups, small groups, growth track, Sunday mornings, Wednesday mornings, 50 life groups. We're just presenting Jesus so you can marvel now. And if you don't marvel now, you can't marvel later. There's nothing but dread and fear and judgment. And that's why I preach. Because God's love has been poured out into my heart. And the love of God is in me for you. Souls matter to me and this church. The eternal. Your soul is at stake. It's eternal. Do you know what? There's two groups. Really, you boil it down to this. There's going to be two groups of people on the day of the Lord. Those who are horrified at the coming of Jesus and those who are glorified at the coming of Christ. I don't want a person in this room to fear the wrath of God. I want you to know that you know that you can let go of fear, embrace Jesus, and know that you know that it, when Jesus comes again, you will be glorified in him. Do you know what it means to be glorified in Jesus? 
Um, it means, it says Christ Jesus will be glorified when we, I wrote this down, I'm gonna read it. When we, with all of the transformation that Jesus did with us, how he redeemed us, we will be glorified because his gl- we will be in our glorified bodies at that point. The rapture had happened seven years prior, in my estimation, and in my interpretation. We would have been with the Lord in the, in, the, in the heavens when he comes back in power and glory and, and with vengeance. We will come with him and we will receive our glorified body like we studied in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. There'll be a day when there'll be a cry, a command from God with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ and the grace will rise first. And after that, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air where we will be with the, together forever with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. And so that's the rapture. And then when we come back again, the, I'm sorry, when we come back again, that's the resurrection. When when the dead in Christ shall rise uh, and, and they'll receive their, gl- we're going to receive our glorified bodies when, Christ, when we come back. I'm sorry. The saints in heaven will come back and we will then receive our glorified bodies at the second coming of Jesus. So you're going to stand there glorified with Jesus. That's what our future is. That's through this lens looking forward into the f- gospel future. It all depends on how you respond today. Will you receive the testimony of Christ? Because it goes on to just say that those, because of our testimony, those people who marvel believed. Let's move you out of the horrified category into the glorified category right now. Only God can do that. Are you ready? If you're here today and you say, I want to follow this beautiful, loving God, who's going to end, put an end to evil and wickedness forever. Set up his kingdom. I want to be with him. If you're here today and you want your sins forgiven, follow me in this prayer and say it boldly. It's about believing Jesus died for your sin. He rose again on the third day. And you're going to confess that he's Lord. But first, you're going to repent for your sins. Follow me nice and loud, out loud. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Father God, I'm a sinner. I repent for my sin. I'm sorry, Lord. I believe the blood of Jesus at the cross of Christ was a place that you paid for that sin. You were judged for my sin in my place so that I could receive your forgiveness and grace. Today, I say yes. And I also believe that you rose from the grave and you reign in power. You're coming back again. So today, I confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And I'm going to walk with you from this day forward.